Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Simon. I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains. And today I want to talk about coroutines and structured concurrency in Kator. But first, I want to thank you all for coming to my talk, everyone for checking in remotely, and everyone for helping organize CollinConf. So what do I hope for you to learn today? When and how should, we, you be, how should you be using coroutines in Kator? How does structured concurrency work in Kator? And what are the best practices of working with coroutines in Kator? So if you're familiar with Kator, you might immediately think about the application class. And the application class lies at the core of every Kator application or server. It's where we do things like install plugins, like content negotiation, metrics, and also routing. And here we have a simple post endpoint, which simply responds hello world to the request. And if you might notice, the respond function is a suspending function. So how is it possible that we can call it here? Well, when the Kator application starts, we install the routing plugin, and the routing plugin creates a new coroutine for every incoming request. And for that incoming request, we will call our route handler, and therefore, we are able to call suspending code inside this created coroutine. And this is extremely powerful, because we can call any arbitrary suspending code inside. We can receive a question from the body of the request, we can then send that question to an LLM, that might take a very long time, so we want to do this in a suspending manner. And when we finally get a reply from the LLM, we can send that reply uh, to the request. But what if we don't need to call suspending functions uh, in sequence? What if we need to run coroutines in parallel? For that, we need the builders from the Colinux coroutines library. And here, for example, we have the async builder. And it's an extension function on the coroutine scope. And you can call a suspending lambda inside, and this suspending lambda returns a meaningful value of type t, and that gives you back a deferred value of type t. And this deferred is a reference to the running coroutine, which is calculating this value of type t, which can be awaited, the coroutine can be cancelled, or the coroutine can be simply joined. But where is that coroutine scope coming from? In our post handler, in the Lambda, we have a suspend function, since we are running in a coroutine, and we have a routing context extension receiver. And this routing context is a simple class with a single property, the routing call, and this routing call is a coroutine scope. So we can use the routing call to create new async coroutines. And here, we have an updated example of our post endpoint, and we use the routing uh, context to access the routing call, we then can create a new async coroutine on that call. And here we are creating two new coroutines, one for asking the LLM a question and one for tracking some metrics. And later down in our code, we need to await these deferred values to extract uh, the created values inside, and we can then send the response to the user. So what is happening here? Again, the application starts, it installs a routing plugin. For every incoming request, we create a new coroutine. And in our coroutine that is created by the routing plugin, we launch or we create two new async coroutines inside. Right? So these coroutines are children of the coroutine scope that is running our route. What if we do not need to return a meaningful value of type T? What if we just need to run some arbitrary side effects? We can use the launch operator from the Kotlinx coroutines library. And the launch operator does not expect a meaningful value of type T, it expects a unit, and it returns you a job. And a job is also a reference to the running coroutine, but this one can only be cancelled or joined. And there is a couple of scenarios that can occur when we are working with launch in Kator. And here we have a simple get endpoint, and I'm launching a new coroutine, which simply waits for 10 seconds, and we immediately send a hello world response to the user. And when our delay finally finishes, 
Well, only when our delay finishes will the actual coroutine complete, right? So remember, structure and concurrency, if you create a new coroutine or a coroutine scope, it will await all the created children inside before itself will be completed. So what if the launch coroutines that was waiting for 10 seconds eventually blows up? We have already sent an OK 200 response to the user. So what is going to happen? Well, in this case, the response is sent. Eventually, the delay fails. And that exception will be locked by the uncaught exception handler from Kator. Luckily, our server does not crash. Our server continues running upon a retry from the client. Hopefully, the second time, it will not fail. Uh, and it can be processed. So what if the opposite happens, right? So we create a new coroutine, but it immediately fails. And processing our request takes some time. What happens here? Well, our coroutine fails. As a result, it cancels its siblings. In this case, the delay, which is running in the coroutine. And since it was canceled, there's nothing to send to the user. So we sent a 500 internal server error. And since we did not explicitly handle uh, the exception, it will still get logged. Luckily, again, Gator continues running, and the client can retry if needed. So what is happening here is that when you create new coroutines, the first thing that fails will win, right? So if you have not sent a response and any of your running coroutines fails, they will take over this response and this will be considered the status of the coroutine in which your route is running. The coroutine fails, then well, 500 internal server error is the only logical thing. So it is very important that if you are launching coroutines, that you're always handling all the errors. Gator does the best it can, which is logging the exception. But this is not perfect. Ideally, you should have fine-grained error messages in your logs, so prefer to get, capture them yourself and give very specific domain-specific log messages so you actually know what is going on. Do not forget your coroutines. Do not forget your exceptions. So what? if you need to launch some coroutines, but you want to make sure that all of them have finished before you actually send a response. Well, in that case, we can use the coroutine scope function from the Kotlin Scoroutines coroutines library, which will await all the launched coroutines inside. So here we have the guarantee that our coroutine scope block starts. All the launched coroutines will have finished before the response is eventually sent to the user. It is very important that you call the launch function on the coroutine scope from the coroutine scope block and no longer call them in the call property from the routing context. If you are still launching your coroutines on the call property from the routing context, it will be a child of the coroutine handling the route. It will not be a child of the coroutine scope that we have explicitly created here. So what if you need to run any coroutine or you need to create any coroutine that does not belong to a route, but it belongs to your application? Well, luckily for us, the application is also a coroutine scope. And this coroutine scope has the same life cycle as your application. So when application starts, this course Coroutine scope is available to you, and when the server shuts down, this coroutine scope will be cancelled and it will await all your coroutines to be completed before the server is considered completely shut down. So what is happening here? Well, here we are processing some messages from a distributed messaging system. I've here used a simple pops up uh, example. And inside of our launch, which we have created a new coroutine directly on the application, so the created coroutine becomes a direct child of the application itself, no longer belonging to the routing plugin, and we can do anything we want here. 
But again, it's very important that you handle the exceptions um, from your Kotlin X flow or from your created coroutines. So here, if you do not handle any exceptions, they will again be logged by the uncaught exception handler. So here we are pattern matching over the exception. We are, for example, saying that if you have an IO exception, I'm going to retrow it. If it is my exception, I want to do something special. I want to send a message downstream in the flow. And if it's something else, then we're going to lock the message. And this is a big difference of wrapping the flow in a try catch because the catch operator can actually still send new events downstream. And again, here's where structure concurrency comes into play. I mentioned before, the coroutine scope of the application has the same life cycle as the application. So if the application shuts down, the coroutine scope gets canceled. So we can attach an on-completion handler on our Kotlin X flow. And if we find a cancellation exception, we know the server is shutting down. And in that case, we can do things like finalize pops up, we can send offsets or commits to the broker, we can do finalization, we can do cleanup, we can all do all these things for a graceful shutdown. So what if you need to create coroutines in your business layer? Right? So far I've been speaking about what do you do in the Cater APIs, but what if you need to work with coroutines in your business layer? Well, you should prefer to encapsulate the coroutine scope so work with coroutine scope directly. Do not inject and leak the application in your business layer if that is not what you need, right? So prefer to inject the coroutine scope into the constructor and do not inject the application directly. Also, it's considered bad practice to implement the coroutine scope and leak it from the service class but because your business layer should not be exposing coroutine scopes, so prefer composition over inheritance and capture the coroutine scopes as a property of the class, ideally a private property, so you can keep everything nice uh, and private. So to recap, what are some of the best practices of working with coroutines? Always handle all uh, the errors in your launched coroutines and always await all the deferreds. Right, so something I forgot to mention before, a deferred, if you're calculating value of type T, this can both be successful or an exception. If you do not await it, this exception will get swallowed. Right? So it is important that you always await all the deferred created values, always handle all your errors in the lounge, and prefer to encapsulate the coroutine scope, prefer composition over inheritance, and sticking to best practices. So I hope it's clear to everyone that Cater loves calling coroutines, and at least I love Cater for it. And I want to thank you all again for coming to my talk today. Please do not forget to vote. If you have any questions, I'll be more than ha happy to answer them here or later at the JetBrains booth, or tomorrow you can also find me at the JetBrains booth. Thank you all so much.